Greetings. It's August 12th, 2015. 30 years ago today, this day. August 12th was a Monday. Um, it was on a Sunday that I went back home from Chestnut Grove Resort to my home at 1386 North Washington Avenue, which we'd only had for like a year. I wasn't seeing Donnie a lot because he was playing out a lot with John Blickens and his band it was doing good. And Donnie was writing good songs. Uh, my brother Mark, uh, who was a waiter, was scheduled to go back with us. Anyway, it was, we had just played the Saturday night before, Saturday before we had played Danny Breyer's wedding. And uh, I wore a pink suit coat and Donnie was pissed. He, he thought I looked like a jerk and I did. And when, we, when we'd sing together, he would give me harmonies or he would sing harmony and he would say, don't go with me, don't sing what I'm singing. And of course I would. I, partially because I just couldn't hear harmonies well, and just part, partially because my, my life sport was getting Donnie pissed, like I really enjoyed that. Uh, so we sang at Donnie, Danny Breyer's wedding, Danny came up the aisle, his wife looked stunning, and I really didn't mean to, but I went with Donnie, I lost, I sang his harmony, and he was pissed. <laughs> so we went out Saturday night over to Gavin's, I tried to make it a little bit better, I think Ned showed up. Um, and the beauty of Ned to me was, as we got older, Ned was, uh, and Kevin and, 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 and Donnie and John Camille and Jimmy Cadden and so many other people were his real friends, like they could hang. And I was the jerk that was always doing something or running to something and I, I wasn't a great friend, but more like a brother. Uh, so we, on Sunday, uh, on Saturday night, we slept in the room on my sister's side of the house now. And it's a bunk bed, uh, a steel bunk bed. And Donnie was on the bottom, I was on the top. And the, the top bunk would shake and it bothered him. He, he, he got freaked by closed places. So, of course, it was fun to tease him all night uh, with, with the, the top bunk kind of falling down and uh, to the point we couldn't sleep. And at about, I don't know, six in the morning, sun was coming up. I said, Mac, why don't, why don't we just go to the resort, come and work for this week, because he was the chef. And he said, all right, do we have a ride from the bus stop at Swiftwater? I said, oh, of course we do. So we took the bus, the March bus, and got off at the entrance to Swiftwater. Of course, we had no ride. And I said, oh, what's today, Sunday? Do you, I, 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 it's Monday, the, the bus, sorry. And we walked all the way from whatever that highway is, 307, I want to say, or 611, into what's what's really kind of freaky is we walked right past the tree that would kill him and, and Mark. Um, and people called it like the, the widow maker, the cemetery tree, because there was marks on it from cars that would make the turn coming up from the Swiftwater Inn. And so we got to the resort, he was off for Sunday, Mark was supposed to come on Monday, and I had to do the horse races on Sunday night. And I was doing the horse races, which are these wooden horses, and people bet on them. And it gets pretty chaotic. And in the middle of chaos, Donnie kept coming from our house, uh, right up onto the stage. And I said, Donnie, what, what do you want? There's, there's ghosts at the house. There's, it's freaky. It's scary. Like three or four times, and I got really pissed. And finally, I packed everything up and I went back to the house. And Donnie said, uh, just listen, you can hear them. And I, I laughed and I said, well, we need weapons, of course, to, to kill the ghosts. And we found two old lamps in the house, took the tops off, and these were our weapons. And I, I, to me, it was hilarious. I was also tired. And I could hear under the house someone say, hey, boss. And that's the only person in my life that called me boss was my brother, Mark. Hey, boss. And then, hey, Todd. And I could hear it clearly. And it kind of freaked me. I didn't, I didn't say anything to Donnie because he was already freaked. We ended up finding no ghosts, but I was sure Mark had come up to give us a hard time. And the next day, Monday, 
Mark came to work and I said, you know, last night was funny. But where did you sleep? Like under the house or something? And he said, I, I was home in Scranton and I, when I called my mom and asked, she affirmed that he was at home. So I don't know who that was under the house. And nobody ever would because it would be that night, uh, a Monday night, that, that things happened. I was doing my follow the jerk with the kids as I would do at the end of the night. Uh, get them up on the top of the hill, all the kids from the resort. These were families that would come for a week, a year to the resort and stay and, and had become very close. And my enjoyment time was like seven, eight o'clock at night after dinner to run them ragged, literally, and sit them up on a hill and listen to their stories and tell them stories. Um, and Mark and Donnie were pissed because they had invited all these people to our cottage. Donnie was hot on this chick, I, I forget her name. Um, and we had two waitresses that worked there, uh, Kathy and Laura Dugan. Kathy, who became and still is like a wildlife expert in Pennsylvania, Laura, um, I don't know, but she drove a, a brown Volkswagen. And they waited for me at the house. I said, you know, just buy whatever you want, get beer, get... And uh, we... I was late with the kids. And Donnie and Mark came back pissed. You know, up in the window and said, like, there's people waiting, we've been waiting for you all summer. Could you finally do something nice and go with, go... Uh... And I went back to the house. And at the house, I remember, it was complete chaos. Like there was a quiet room near the near the little veranda. This is an old house, old wood, rotting wood. And one room was like people snorting lines and one room people drinking and it was a wonderful time. And I remember about one o'clock, people getting tired and me of course being the joker in my underwear with a, a big tray, jumping up and down on the bed, which was actually in the living room. And uh, Laura was half asleep on the side of the bed. Um, and Donnie said, we're out of beer, let's go get beer. And I, there was a, a kid that would stay with us from the Baumgartner family, a big athletic kid, Bobby, who thought I was something great and would always hang out with me. And of course I was being a jerk and I didn't want him to watch me. <clears throat> but I said, Bobby, you know, watch what I do and just as you become an adult, make sure you don't do what I do. And Laura was dead asleep. And at the last second, uh, Donnie was going into his room, maybe to sleep, kind of giving up on the whole late night beer run. And I dropped my little tray, made a sound, and, and uh, Laura turned around, saw me in my underwear, and, and said, you're disgusting, which, which I was. And uh, I woke up. And Donnie came out and saw her and said, all right, let's go for beers. And, we all went out into the brown Volkswagen, Laura driving me behind her, uh, Donnie in the front, Mark in the back, and then uh, uh, Bob, little Bobby, who's actually big, couldn't get in the car, and and uh, so he and I got out. I didn't want him to, to, to stay alone, so I got out of the car and said, okay, just go down and come back, and they went down to the Swift Water Inn. It was about 1.30. And I went into my room and I had a notebook uh, uh, I like to write. And I, I, I wrote down, and I still have the, the page in, in one of my diaries, that I was just rich. I was so fat and content to have my brother Mark, who many of us may forget, like died in the same day, and, and loved Donnie, adored Donnie, and adored me and my father, and Donnie. Uh, and I wrote, I was, you know, wrote, how could someone be so blessed and what would make many people think it was obnoxious maybe, but that's how I truly felt and feel. And uh, I fell asleep at about two. And at about 5.30, Sam Delisino, the owner, came and grabbed my foot and he said, uh, get up. And Carol, his wife, was with him, and she was in tears, and she said, you're not dead. And then I said, I don't think so. And then everything came to hit me, because Donnie had my ID, I knew that. And they said there was an accident, and uh, Donnie and Mark are dead. And I said, well, uh, you know, 
somebody got a, what do you do? And the only time in my whole life that somebody said, are you all right? And I said, no, it was that morning. And like a zombie, I don't really know how, I got up and gathered all their stuff into my old van and and drove to Scranton in the rain. And, and uh, I really don't know how I got home. But when I got to my house and went up the stairs to my mother's room, the door was open already. And she was like half awake. And when I grabbed her, she turned and she had tears in her eyes and she said, something bad, I, 2 a.m. She said she had woken up and just, and just knew something was bad. And I said, Donnie and Mark are dead. And all through my life, losing people, a year before that I had lost my dad and then two years before Stephen Gresh, who was like another brother. I, I go into this uh, shut up and operate mode where, where I'm kind of non-emotional and just, just take care of other people. Uh, maybe other people have the same thing. And we had to, Mark's family in Massachusetts, who had never had anything to do with them really, were calling and saying really mean things. We want the van back. It was my van. They thought it was his. And we had to do a funeral with no body. They, they insisted we send the body back to Massachusetts. And Donnie's funeral, I believe, was at St. Gregory's in Park Summit. But I, I remember I had to sing at both of them funerals and they were in the same day or a couple of days apart and and I remember the second funeral was Mark's and some lady coming up to my mother next to me and saying well your son is amazing to be able to do this and I got very angry inside kind of kind of angry to God to everything and to say you give me an effing choice like you there is no choice um, it became a song. I wrote a song called Deny from that day, from that response. But I remember saying something at, at Mark's funeral. I don't know if anyone remembered. I said, today, death score is 100. 100 points. Like, death took someone we love and something beautiful from our lives. And that's really it. But I believe love, if it's inspired, gains points as well. And and for every time we do something with Donnie or Mark in our hearts, that's good, <laughs> that's a point. And now it's 30 years. And since they died, every time I go on stage, which has been, we counted the other day, it's pretty freaky, 3,000 or more performances all over the world, really. Um, and every one, I stop to take time when it's all over and to stand on the stage alone, thank the spirits that are inhabit the place, but thank my father, my friends, and Mark and Donnie. Keep them with me. And and when my nephew JT killed himself four years ago, at his funeral, the heaviest thing I've experienced as far as, whoa, look at these people in front of me and his four kids, and what do you say? And I said that to his three-year-old son, Tavian. Tavian, we're going to play the love and death game. And Daddy died today, and that's 100, and we're going to do what we can with love. And I, I firmly believe now in my life, my belief in religion um, has faded, and I just can't buy the Amway anymore. I, I, I look for God, and I, I just think he's overpraised and underworked. But I so much believe in love and believe in, in faith, this naked faith, not with you know some vicious God or, or just God, and, uh, but just the love that we have between each other. And it's real, this is something you can touch. And, and I hope today, like as everyone gets together, as you touch each other, don't touch too much, um, as you touch each other in so many ways, like that's, they're alive. They're truly alive. And right now I'm on the Kuching River in Borneo, uh, one of the last big rainforests of the world in Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, three countries on this island. 
We just finished the Rainforest Music Festival, which was phenomenal. People from all over the world. So, and someone said to me at this festival, who was just at one of our festivals in Thailand, they said, it seems like these events are, they really are big families. Like what if we made kids go to festivals? It was part of their school education. Because these little kids that go to these festivals, you see, once their eyes are open, you, you'll never close them again. When they see people of every color, and um, my parents gave us that. My friends gave gave me that, and, and I think it's where the world's headed. We just don't know how to say it right, so we say it's like uh, new marriage laws or um, uh, immigration. Well, what, what what humanity's trying to say, I think, is that we're supposed to be one. We're one big soul that's gotten separated, and and religion is, has actually, in my opinion, done very badly for humanity, separated us even more, made us think we're right even more. And the fact is, if you get rid of the standards and the comparisons and all the bullshit that people try to sell us is correct and, and, and take a ride on the river, there's a lot to see. Um, I miss Donnie and Mark every day. Every day. And I'm so glad. Thank you, Kevin and Ned and other people for deciding to have this day and I'm really sorry I can't be there I tried uh, but I'll be home in September and I'd love to see everyone finally uh, I propose a scholarship a Donnie and Mark scholarship and I'll put up the first air ticket in February of next year we'll have our 10th annual Rhythm of the Earth World Festival in Bangkok people from all over the world and I'd like to bring an artist who does their own music from Scranton. Actually, I have a little girl in mind that I saw when I was home last time, but anyone you'd like to suggest. And I'll pay for the air ticket and accommodations and all that stuff if anyone else wants to offer a performance fee or something. Um, and I'd like to do it every year and it might grow to support young people who are, who are creating and writing music. I remember Donnie writing this song and I was embarrassed because I was supposed to be the cool guy and my song sucked when we were 22. His songs were good. And he wrote one that went something like, When we were young, they said time would fly. It really didn't matter to you or I. Now these days have slowly come and gone. Just a faded memory seems to linger on. But in case you're feeling blue, there's one thing I can do I can sing this song For all my friends For all my friends I sing For all my friends who hear this song Won't you sing along with me? Won't you sing? He wrote some beautiful songs. I think we should gather them and make an album. Donnie Mac, Mark, you're with me. Rock on.